Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Innovation Conversation. Today, we are joined by Tyler Gordon. Tyler, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much, Ricardo. It's a pleasure having you here, Tyler. Tyler, would you like to introduce yourself a bit to the audience, please? Yeah, sure. Well, my name is Tyler Gordon. Uh, I'm originally from South Florida, but I've been living in Portugal for about four and a half years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur. I've built a few successful businesses and consultancies and uh, uh, currently building some interesting things here in Portugal. Interesting. Okay, so there, there's a lot to unravel here. Obviously, I'm biased because you're you're in my hometown, so I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about the move to Portugal, which for me is quite fascinating. But I guess the first one, can you tell us a bit more like all the companies you got started and how did you end up in Portugal? How did that journey went? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, since I was in middle school and high school, I was my buddies and I were selling websites. Uh, yeah, I guess my first big business that I built was in, um, in my 20s, we built a real estate technology business mm -hmm. that built uh, scheduling and messaging tools for real estate agents called Agent Inbox. And we ended up uh, scaling it to about 10% of the US, uh, raising some money and exiting the business. Um, I'm also the chief operating officer of a consulting business called Big Binary. So we're a high-end software development agency, and we have about 200 engineers, employees, and we build software for like AngelList, Major League Baseball. We've had four startups that we built that have been sold. I actually hired them back in 2013 to build my first startup. That's how I got connected with okay. them. And uh, yeah, just uh, building some other organizations here in Portugal besides Tejamed. One's a uh, intergenerational housing charity. We're matching older Portuguese people that live alone with uh, people that need uh, affordable housing. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So how how did that happen? Because everyone I talk to in Europe always wants to go to the States, but you actually moved the other way back or the other way, I mean, the other way around. So how, how did it happen? Yeah, so I've been working remotely since 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and so my last business in the U.S., uh, you know, I, I could be remote, but I, I had to go to a lot of meetings and in-person things. And it was always a dream of mine to live abroad and to spend time in different countries. And mm -hmm. so uh, after the Agent Inbox company, I sold my things and moved into my backpack and was traveling for about two years, working and helping run the consulting business. And uh, I arrived here January 2020. Mm, and the timing. <laughs> I, I, I had no intentions. Perfect I, I, timing. I honestly didn't even... Uh, know much about Portugal at the time. I had a bunch of Portuguese friends from the Bay Area, but that's mm -hmm. about it. And I liked it. So I extended one month and two months and three months. Then the pandemic happened and now I live here. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like living in Portugal as an American uh, really is, um, you know, in the United States, I feel like people's identities are tied to their work, where I feel like people here in Europe um Work doesn't necessarily come first, and you can have relationships with people for a very long time where nobody ever talks about work. And I, I have a, it's a little bit yeah. of a detox of my American entrepreneur entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit being in this type of community. So, yeah, that, that is actually it's um, it's very true. I think at least, especially in Portugal, we tend not to ask what people do for a living. We just take them for oh, they're here. What's your name? Okay, we'll do we'll do with you as an individual, not so yeah. much show your job title because. Unless you're a doctor, which you can always use a doctor, right? Um, then people really don't care, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's uh, it's really, I think there's a balance that I like halfway between the two, where work does not come first in life, but mm -hmm. also, you know, as, as people that like building things, I mean, it's just, it's our passion and there's really nothing I'd rather do most of the time than just create interesting things, so. Did you find it like when you launched your company here? So to actually tell us a bit more about what you do right now with your company in Portugal. Yeah. So we're building Portugal's first concierge doctor's clinic. Um, mm -hmm. So concierge medicine has been around in the United States at this point for 20 years and um, some very, very large companies uh, in the space. Uh, and the idea behind concierge medicine is um, you pay a membership fee that allows a doctor to see less patients and provide you with personalized care. So most care at this point is, uh, today is if something's broke, you go to the doctor and they fix it. Mm -hmm. Where concierge medicine is really focused on trying to prevent things from breaking um, early on. Um, and more of a practical standpoint would be um, both here and in the United States, if you want to see a GP or family medicine doctor that you like, 
Uh, oftentimes it takes a while to get in. You get there, the doctor's super late. Uh, you have a 15 minute appointment that's like super rushed and the doctor doesn't even know your name. They focus on giving drugs and treating symptoms. And you know, it's not the doctor's fault either. I mean, the system, when doctors are paid per volume of patients they see, um, they see end up seeing about two or 3,000 patients per year. And just that's what they have to do. With our business, Concierge Medicine, um, you know, as I said, you have a membership fee. So the doctor sees less patients. In our clinic, it's instead of two or 3,000 patients per doctor, it's under 500. And you have a relationship with one doctor who knows you inside and out. Um, for example, your first appointment's over an hour and a half long. They get to know you, they do a comprehensive physical. They run all these tests, focus on prevention and longevity. Um, you can make same or next day appointments in our clinic. They're 30 minutes to an hour and they start on time. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor gives you their cell phone, so you can call, email, text anytime. And you just have someone that like is there for you, whatever you need. They're proactively working with you to make sure you're healthy. So, And how, how did you come up with the idea? So being here four and a half years uh, in Portugal, um, I'm a human. I have medical issues sometimes. And like, uh, yeah, I was just dealing with some things and getting a bit frustrated with the lack of attention I was getting from doctors. And you know, sometimes after the appointment, you know, follow up questions or uh, if you're taking any medicine, the doctor, you need to follow up with the doctor. And mm -hmm. I was just not able to go through this process in a way that I found acceptable. I was complaining to my parents <laughs> and my parents were like, Tyler, you're a professional. Why don't you get a concierge doctor? You know, we both have concierge doctors here in Florida. You should get one. And I'm like, yeah, of course. And that sounds great. I'm like, mm -hmm sign up immediately. And I started researching concierge medicine here and I couldn't find anybody doing it. And after that, I was like, okay, well, you know, I, I learned a bit about the business model. I really became very fascinated by the incentive model of the business mm -hmm. as well. And uh, we decided to launch one here in Portugal and we're really, it's going great at this point. Nice. So, did, yeah. did you, how, you know, comparing with the, the companies you launched in the US, how hard was it to actually launch a company in Portugal? It's a bit difficult to build a business here. There's just a lot of bureaucracy. Um, service providers uh, tend to move a bit slower, um, mm -hmm. less of a pressing in priority for a lot of things. So, yeah, I mean, in the US, you can incorporate a business in 15 minutes on the internet and open up a bank account shortly afterwards. And yep. um, we're in Portugal. Um, there's just a lot, a lot more details that need to be um, addressed through the entire process. I know the Portuguese government's spending a lot of time and effort right now trying to simplify a lot of these things, and I expect that to be how things continue. But it's a bit more challenging than um, my previous experiences. Interesting. You know, in terms of investment and finding investment, did, was that something you did for your business right now, or you're self-funding the business? Yeah. So previous businesses, we've raised. Uh, financing millions of dollars and um, going into this business, we were very deliberate about picking a business that would be cash flow positive early on, mm -hmm. that didn't require a ton of capital, that um, could grow as large as we want it to be. So yep. for example, if we want to keep it a small business, um, it could be a profitable, healthy business where we take care of everybody. But at the same time, if we just want to keep growing or if we start growing quickly, we want to raise money, we can. So at this point, we are... Uh, self-financed through our other ventures mm -hmm. and um uh, we're not opposed to taking money on I mean, it's not a bad thing a few of us on the team invest in other businesses but we just want the optionality and also the ability to control have a tightly held business at this point so interesting and you know what are your plans for the future for the business yeah i mean right now the focus is just building a healthy business uh, i mean it's not not only is it a business that's focused on health but mm -hmm. We want a business where we pay people really well, uh, where people, obviously the first two years of a startup, you have to bust your butt and really make things happen. But um, we want a business where we can respect people's lifestyles. Um, and we, we're not building a lifestyle business. Um, I heard an expression recently, which was a dividend business. So a lifestyle business is like the small one where you just kind of relax and you work yeah. a couple hours a day. Um, everyone's trying to go after these unicorn businesses where you need to exit for hundreds of millions of dollars for your investors to even mm -hmm. be happy. Where a dividend business is a business that can grow at its own pace and pays all of the principals and people involved very well. Um, so, you know, our target is to grow across all of Portugal. 
Um, we know we can have a very healthy, profitable business where we take care of our employees and our patients and the doctors. Uh, but if it, if we want to keep growing, you know, hopefully we will have the option at that point. So nice. It seems, it seems like the future is bright. I mean, what feedback are you getting from both doctors and, and, uh, you know, actual, uh, people using the, the service? Yeah. So on, on the doctor side, I mean, at the end of the day, we are in the business of having happy doctors. Mm -hmm. you know, we have happy doctors. The doctors will do an amazing job of taking care of the patients. Um, and so right now, most doctors, I mean, you hear about it. It's not just in Portugal, like doctors are overworked. They have too many patients. And so with the concierge model, I guess there's a two major innovations. Um, one is that the doctors, uh, instead of running and rushing through the day, they can walk through their day. Hmm. All the busy days, they're still focused on patient care like, all the time, but they actually get a chance to, to be doctors and spend time with patients and get to know them and get to know their life story and their history and have this relationship. And um, you know, most doctors went to med school not to make a lot of money. They went to med school to take care of people. And so the doctors absolutely love this model as well um, because they get to do what they're, they're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also with the doctors, we split the subscription revenue with the doctors. So the doctor's incentives, so it's not fee per service. Most doctors right now get paid based on the volume of patients they see, where in concierge medicine, because there's this rev share component, the uh, doctors are incentivized to keep patients happy and healthy. So there's this like really nice uh, blend between the two. And then on the patient side, I mean, we've been told... Pretty much every single patient we've had has told us it's the best healthcare experience they've ever had in Portugal, and that they've never had a doctor spend as much time with them and care about them, and the whole system of being able to just chat and text with the doctor after the appointments and make quick appointments. It's just a breath of fresh air that allows people to really go deep and have that have their those things that kind of been bugging them for a long time addressed in an iterative fashion that with someone they trust. So it makes uh, sense. because so many times I remember going to the doctor and then being pres prescribed something and then not being able to give feedback on that prescription, because this is it, this is the final word. And you always need to follow the doctor's instructions, but actually it, they might not be right. Um, so you might need to you know, get some feedback and actually go back to the doctor and say, Hey, can we change this? Can we adapt that? But then that's another appointment you need to book. And then you need to schedule something else. And then, If you're not doing to private healthcare, it's an absolute nightmare to get that that type of access, isn't it? So yeah. definitely, yeah. I think like we like to think about like healthcare 3.0, right? Which mm -hmm. is adding in the lifestyle components, adding in the root cause analysis components, and it like it's not just about drugs and treatment. It's about understanding the person as a whole. I mean, you might have a problem with your knee. And you go to the knee doctor and they, mm -hmm. they do this particular thing with your knee. But if the doctor doesn't have the time to really look into it, maybe it's your back. Maybe <laughs> your back's yeah. a little bit off. Um, or maybe you have some stomach issues and the, the doctors like take this stomach medication. But really, maybe it's a diet adjustment or maybe it's something that if you have the time to work through it with somebody, you, get, you could really figure out what that root cause is. That's really the basis for longevity and prevention, having a, a fulfilling lifestyle life is being able to address the issues at the root cause as opposed to just treating symptoms. So. Yeah. If, if you could fix something, I guess, in the Portuguese ecosystem, what would you fix? Question. Now, I, I feel like a, from an entrepreneurship standpoint, a lot of mm -hmm. times when I talk to other entrepreneurs about ideas, I feel like people very much, uh, it needs to be like all or nothing, where if the idea isn't taking over the world in a billion dollar business, uh, it's not exciting. Mm -hmm. Or as well as if someone else is doing it, um, that means they can't do it. Where I think uh, in the United States, there's very much the idea of the pie gets bigger, the more you build. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, you, know, you don't need to build a billion dollar business. I mean, if we build a billion dollar business, that'd be great. But most businesses, that are successful, that um, earn money for people and have healthy, ha happy, healthy people working there. Um, they're small businesses or they're medium sized businesses. And so um, I think that's a completely reasonable goal is to go after businesses that are um, of whatever size they get to. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the uh, other people are doing it side. I mean, I think that's how innovation happens often is competition. It's like, hey, these people are doing it. Yeah. Let's, let's just try to do a better version of it. 
And um, I don't know, it's just some experiences I've had with people. And I think that as more entrepreneurship and innovation happens, that mindset will also shift. You know, when you're building all these businesses, I'm sure you, you come across really dark moments and hard times. How do you overcome them? And what advice would you actually give to people going through them right now? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, I, I advise some other startups in the consulting business as well. We work with early stage businesses quite a lot. And I, I think people are just surprised when they hit these existential threats mm -hmm. in the startup journey. And uh, people just think, oh my God, it's the end of the world. We have this thing and if it doesn't get resolved, it's the end of the business. Why would this, why, this happen? Why is this happening to me? I, this never happens to anyone else, which that's completely untrue. I feel like anytime you start an organization that is innovative, you're going to hit a couple existential threats along the way. Mm -hmm. And really just kind of just saying, hey, this is normal. This is expected. Let's figure out a way to move through it and not becoming panicked or, you know, wrecked about it. I think that's a, a, a very reasonable approach. Um, I also think just like you know, mental health, just having a network of friends, uh, potentially doing therapy, mm -hmm. um, having ways to kind of reflect on things is really important. And it's not talked enough in the entrepreneurship community yeah. where you know, a lot of entrepreneurs I know, including myself, when I did my first business, I just go, go, go all the time. And so when these dark moments happen and you haven't really built a infrastructure around you that can support you, um, it gets very challenging where, you know, if you have people that are experienced or people that uh, know you well, you can have these conversations and relate to them and um, get a lot more perspective on things that are happening. Because oftentimes startup challenges seem like you're the only person that's ever gone through it when in reality, it's like anything in life. You know, in yeah. reality, a lot of people have experienced it. And maybe they have some perspective that can help out. Do you have like a, a group, a good support group that has a lot of entrepreneurs or it's just people that actually do completely random things? Yeah, it's funny. I, I feel like here in Portugal, we've developed a community of, of friends that are all doing very exciting things mm -hmm. and interesting projects, but like the group didn't form around those projects, They kind of form more organically around relationships and being friends. Mm -hmm. And then as we all got to know each other better, you're like, oh, wow, we're all doing really uh interesting things in our professional careers and um but but even if that's not your case i, mean, I feel like it's people can go foster this I mean, there's so many entrepreneurship meetups and um people that just like talking about things even if they're not entrepreneurs a lot of people that work in larger companies like to talk about this stuff and participate in it and if you want to foster this community i very mm -hmm. much encourage people to do so I'm, I'm always curious on one thing. What was the biggest cultural shock you had? Because you were having in Portugal just amongst the pandemic, right? So it's not really the best time because everything was shut, shut off or shut down. Um, so how you know, what was the biggest shock you had? I think the most challenging thing is to slow down the expectations on how <laughs> bad things are going to get done. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of services and things that you need, expecting mm -hmm. it to take a couple tries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if your AC is broken, it might not get fixed the first time they visit. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, coming from the US, which is just like, go, 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 both professionally and personally. I mean, mm -hmm. it's easy to get very frustrated in that situation, but I, I feel like um, it's also been a healthy and refreshing shift in my personal development where I've said, okay, it's just, it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be done right now. And, uh, yeah, it's just part of the culture a lot of the times here. So interesting. Yeah. Cause it's always, I don't know like, everyone I talk to and they, they actually have the same thing. And I have the same problem every time I go back to Portugal, which is I'm on the go, go, go mode. And then everyone else is very slow. And I just, start, it, it starts driving me nuts. Like, why isn't this done straight away? Right. Like, why are they taking so long to service at the restaurant or something like that? It just drives me nuts. But then I get, okay, I'm, I'm thinking like someone who lives in a big city. So every time I come back, I'm like, mm, okay, slow down a bit because people are just chill. Yeah. Yeah, that's a... yeah. I feel like um, halfway way between the two is a healthy approach. You know, like, I don't want it to take five times to get my refrigerator fixed. Mm -hmm. But I also don't need to be just a crazy person and be like, 
hey, this needs to get done within an hour. Like there's like a, a blend between those two spots that is a good place to be in. A sweet spot. What was the, the biggest biggest challenge you had in, in Tejomet when you were building it? Hmm. I, I think um, uh, we expected this, but it took longer than we expected this one part, which was just recruiting an amazing doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, our first uh, concierge doctor, which is, uh, I think culturally, Portugal people tend to be a little bit more risk adverse. Um, and then on top of that, layering in doctors being a bit risk adverse. Mm -hmm. And so you know, there's, 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 there's the fact that we're pitching this new model to a doctor that we want them to join a early stage business. I don't even want to call it a startup because it is a sort a, a service mm -hmm. business at the end of the day. We're at the same time, we want to find the best people. I mean, we're building a new business and we're focused on delivering the top, the best care we can in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, so we needed a doctor that wanted to join, mm -hmm. that was technically skilled as a uh, practitioner, but also a huge part of this business is uh, building relationships with patients. So they also need that relationship component, which um, took us a bit, bit of time to find the right person. And our current doctor, uh, Dr. Luisa Batista is amazing. Um, she checks all the boxes and um, everybody is obsessed with their, that senior. So, yeah. so you have, how many doctors do you have in the platform? I mean, obviously we won't be, it doesn't need to be a crazy number because then they can serve as quite a lot of people, but roughly. Yeah, we, we just launched two months ago. So we have one okay. full-time concierge doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have a nurse who's also amazing together. I mean, we give them the time to serve their patients and mm -hmm. really be there for whatever they need. So yeah. interesting. And how, you know, the feedback you're getting from patients and, and stuff, what I know you already told me what they're saying, but do they, do they share the word with their friends and they say, Hey, actually start doing this because it actually works really well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, half of our customers at this point have been referrals and this is just early on. So like right now, the challenge is just getting in front of more people because it's a unique model that people typically don't have experience with, mm -hmm. especially here in Portugal. So there's a bit of education and, um, but typically after somebody has their first, uh, comprehensive exam, the first one, like people are just like, oh my God, like this, this is, I've never had somebody spend so much time really learning about me and addressing things that you know, are typically overlooked. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's completely different because normally I think they just give you, they kind of patch you up, isn't it? You go to the doctors, they give you some medicine. Okay. You're good to go. But actually maybe the problem is a lot deeper than that. And then they actually need to spend some time with you and really analyze it well. But yeah. And it's not the doctor's fault. Like the, like, you know, it's easy to blame doctors that are spending 15 minutes with you, but you know, their income model is tied to volume of patients they see, mm -hmm. how insurance reimburses. There's not a system that, that encourages prevention and personalized health care and working with people to make sure that they their root causes are addressed. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we've seen in the United States, because we've studied the market really extensively, which is that you end up saving money. Even though we're a premium service and we charge a monthly fee, that is... Um, higher than most people have paid for other healthcare services. The the end result is it saves you money and time in the long run, and, and most importantly, uh, you have a better, um, you're healthier, and you can enjoy your life and your time better. So interesting. And you know, in this whole ecosystem, what do you think about the city of Lisbon? Like overall, do you think it's buzzing, not buzzing? What do you think? Ah, oh, Lisbon's the best. It's just uh, <laughs> a lot, lot of beautiful people. Um, I, I love Portuguese food. I love Portuguese culture. I love Portuguese people. Um, I feel very much like this is my home. Uh, estou a aprender português. Oh, well done. <laughs> Not suficient para fazer um podcast. Well, that's all right. We always do it in English anyway, so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, the city is just changing so much. And, um, you know, it's really unfortunate because I feel like there's a lot of uh, frustration with the, the amount of change that's happening in Lisbon because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people that are living here is not being, you know, there's, there's things that are missing to protect people that um, currently have their lives here. Um, at the same time, I think you're seeing the same trend in most major cities around the world. Um, the rise in remote work has led mm -hmm. people to move to cities where there's either a price arbitrage or there's just a high quality of life in the particular mm -hmm. city. 
And so, um, you know, I don't think that that is specific to Lisbon, even though when you're living there, I mean, it, it feels like that's the experience. Right. Well, I'm curious on one thing, you know, some, a lot of people say they want to move to the U.S. to do business. Now, you had the experience of doing business in the U.S. and doing business also in Europe and Portugal. Um, do you think that's relevant? Like, does it actually come a stage where, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, you actually should move to another country? Or quite on the contrary, you can always find what you need in, in the country you're at. I think it comes down to your personal objectives and the type of business that you want to build. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt that the U.S. has the best infrastructure today to build early stage businesses at scale. Mm -hmm. um, it has uh, so many vendors that are very U.S. specific that can um, support your journey of building the business. You have a massive investor community, 150 million people that have high buying power. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's it's a huge market, right? Um, but, uh, you know, it's also hyper competitive. And um, I, a lot of times, if you want to build a business, at least at scale, um, mm -hmm. you know, A, that's, it's, it's easier to do it there. But at the same time, you might, as I said, there's a lot of competition. Where uh, being in a smaller country like Portugal or in Europe or any other country, um, there's a lot of country and cultural specific uh, both challenges and opportunities. Um, you know, this business that we're building, um, Injectors is a um, higher margin, lower volume business. So being a, in a country of 10 million people, um, uh, we can create economic opportunity for us and for people we work with, thinking through what we can build here in a way that will work for us. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think it also comes down to what lifestyle you want. I mean, I think if you want to just do the startup grind and hustle and, you know, really bust your ass to build something, take over the world, you know, mm -hmm. living in New York or the Bay Area, great places to do it, probably as well as London. Uh, but if you want to have more of a chill lifestyle, um, yeah, Portugal provides that in many ways. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I, I think... Uh, a lot of people I talk to, they always want to grow and they want to grow in the U.S., but I don't think they realize what it takes to actually grow the business there because, like I said, it's super competitive and it's it takes a lot for me, right? It's not just something you can just chill. Oh, I'm going to finish at five o'clock. No, you're not. You're going to continue working until you get stuff done. So that's that's a bit of a lifestyle change for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, and, and I think in the United States, people just identify so much with their work as part mm -hmm. of who they are and... It just that's the culture, you know. It's there's not it's not that it's right or wrong. It's just that is it's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about the taxes? I'm always curious because you did move to a country that has a higher taxation overall. So, how how does that feel like? Hmm. I mean, if you're earning uh, a lot of money in the United States, the tax bracket is pretty similar to what uh, higher income Portuguese taxes are. Okay. Uh, right now, you know, we're building this business. So I'm trying to figure out as an American, as an American, I'm taxed in both countries regardless. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just currently working with our tax accountant to try to figure out how do we structure things correctly. Yeah, I mean, I do feel like taxes in Portugal are um, complicated and make it difficult to... Um, you know, one of the issues I run into here is it, it's not that the taxes are unjustified or too high as much as that it... it it's difficult to understand them and move through the process mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. also, but for, for a corporation specifically, they're a lot more simple. Uh, personal taxes mm -hmm. are always complicated, but I don't know. You can't escape taxes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm always curious because, you know, when people think, for example, they want to open a business, there's a couple of states that always uh, spring to mind, right? Florida being one of them, then Texas, and obviously Delaware, because mm -hmm. they normally have lower taxes. And I was curious to understand, like, when you move to Europe, you always end up paying a lot more taxes when compared to those other uh, states, in, in this case, in the U.S. So that's that's what I'm just curious about. Like, how big of a shock was that? I, it's, when we built this business, it was expected that we were going to pay Portuguese taxes. So, um, you know, I think when you think through the model and you think through the opportunity, that's part of just figuring out what you're going through. Um, yeah, I, I, I think both countries taxes are pretty high um, and, and not suggesting that they should be lower, but 
Um, it's a political discussion that yeah, there's uh, a pl- yeah, those <laughs> on a different podcast, but yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I it's especially being American where you're required to file in both countries and pay taxes in both countries just makes it quite complicated and something that needs to be very deliberately addressed early on if you're doing entrepreneurship outside the United yeah. States. So. But then if something goes wrong, the Marines come in and save you. So it's not all that bad. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, Tyler, um, if people want to reach out to you and find more about Tejomed, how, how can they do so? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can check out our website, uh, Tejomed, T-E-J-O-M-E-D.com. Uh, you can find me at, on LinkedIn, Tyler Gordon, um, also Tyler at Tejomed.com. Uh, yeah, I'm always happy to talk about entrepreneurship, um, other startups. I do a bit of angel investing as well um, and just like to work with people that are doing amazing things and sharing things. And so, uh, yeah. Sounds good. Tyler, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ricardo.